morning, everyone. We're going to wait a couple of minutes um, and get started um, once most of our people have joined. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome to our nimble led program webinar series. Today we'll be sharing our soon to be launched viral vector manufacturing and analytics program. My name is Angie Snell Bennett and I am the program manager for vectors. Before we get started, we have a couple of announcements. Um, can you go to slide 2? It went a long time ago. <laughs> Sorry, I have a delay. Um, so you'll be muted throughout the presentation. You can use the Q&A to ask a question or to post a comment. You can use the chat feature. Uh, for those of you not familiar with WebEx, the chat bubble is in the lower right corner. And to access the Q&A, you can use the three dots in the lower right corner. Uh, reminder that this webinar is open to Nimble members and non-members please do not post nimble, confidential, or proprietary information in the chat or the Q&A. And then at the end, a survey will be sent uh, via email shortly after the webinar. To access the slides and the webinar recording, it will, be it will be granted upon completion of the survey. Now, before we get started with the actual vector presentation, we'd like to give a brief introduction into Nimble for the non-members on the call. Chris Yoakum is our head of business development, and he's been with Nimble since the beginning. He's going to give a brief introduction into who we are and what we do. Following Chris, Tim Charlebaugh will be giving our viral vector presentation. Tim serves as a senior fellow here at Nimble, joining us last year after a 30-year career at Pfizer. Tim is leading our vector program and is going to share the vision we've created for the program with help from the community. Uh, next slide. And Chris, you're up. Great, thank you, Angie. And Tim, thank you for the invitation to be part of your uh, your webinar today. Um, I promise to be very brief, but we did think that due to the diverse nature of the participants in the webinar, some of whom have only been a member for a while and others who are not yet members, we thought it would be, be very helpful to everyone to just give a brief overview of Nimble. If you leave here uh, today with one, uh, one, one thing about Nimble, It'll be the next 30 seconds, and that is that we are a federally funded uh, biomanufacturing consortium made up of large and small industry uh, from the uh, biopharmaceutical industry and uh, top tier academic engineering institutions who all work collaboratively and pre competitively to de risk innovative technologies, <clears throat> excuse me, innovative technologies so that they can. Uh, accelerate uh, the manufacturing of complex biopharmaceutical products to ultimately benefit patients. Next slide. So, Nimble is actually part of the Manufacturing USA Institutes. There are, this is a uh, project that's been around for over 10 years, and these utilize the consortium approach uh, to advance and de risk manufacturing technologies to improve. Uh, the production of uh, electronics, materials, uh, biomanufacturing, and energy and digital automation. You'll see in the middle that uh, Nimble is part of the Biomanufacturing Consortium. We were actually the first. 
uh, and we focus again exclusively on biotherapeutics. Our sister organization, Biofab, focuses on regenerative medicine. And one of the newest entrants is Biomade that focuses on bioindustrial manufacturing. Next slide, please. So why the consortium approach? This is actually a, a proven method uh, uh, within the biopharmaceutical industry to de-risk novelty in R&D. What is unique is the application of this consortium approach to manufacturing. Um, it's been my experience, and uh, the landscape has changed significantly in the six years that Nimble's been around, that uh, R&D uh, in global pharma is, um, is very used to externalization and engagement and collaboration, but maybe not so much in the biomanufacturing side of the business. And so you can see from this uh, pictorial that uh, the consortium approach brings together large companies, manufacturing companies, suppliers and instrument companies, and then innovative small to medium sized companies with unique platforms, uh, some of which uh, have not been de-risked sufficiently to be adopted. And then we have the benefit of engaging with the academic side, which bring a great deal of intellectual capacity to problem solving. So we have universities and engage with uh, the national labs, and, uh, and also community colleges. And then the reason the community colleges and some universities are involved is because one aspect of what we do is also address skills gap and talent development. So we have a very robust workforce development part of Nimble that's actually uh, produced some of our uh, biggest benefits early in the organization's history. We also work with, uh, again, federal governments, uh, uh, scientists from NIST, scientists from FDA who are all engaged in uh, in our various projects. Uh, next slide, Tim. So we're well funded. We're in our sixth year now. We've just been renewed for another five year contract. So to date, uh, thanks to uh, thanks to the prowess of our Institute director, Kelvin Lee, we've been able to amass close to six hundred million dollars in federal funding, as well as substantial funding that has come from the American Recovery Plan, and also uh, our uh, membership fees that are paid by our large industry members, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Next slide, Tim. So these are our large industry members in that center block. We're very fortunate to have engagement with 14 of the major global biopharmaceutical companies, as well as about 10 of the major suppliers uh, that uh, and indeed, we found through the pandemic that Nimble uh, became a gathering place uh, for companies and their subject matter experts to, to get together and to discuss the challenges and potential solutions. Across the top of the slide, you'll see 70 or so logos. Those are, some are pure play biotechs, but most are platform technology companies. Some are startups and others are fairly well established. On the sides there are our academic institutions uh, and we're, again, we, we leverage the, uh, the knowledge and the experience that they have at problem solving in our nimble funded projects. And across the bottom, you'll see logos for some of the community colleges and nonprofits that are involved in workforce development. Next. So this uh, pictorial has been around quite a while, but it actually summarizes uh, quite easily what it is that we, uh, we are engaged in. It identifies what are the needs, why do we exist. Uh, again, Nimble focuses on both existing uh, biotherapeutics, such as proteins, vaccines, and monoclonal antibodies. But as you're going to hear about later today, some of the emerging products and the impact that uh, vector technologies, uh, vector manufacturing has in both gene and uh, cell and gene therapy. So if we're successful, you can see that the outcome is, is quite beneficial both to uh, to patients and to the economy, and that uh, there the industry will also benefit uh, by being able to adopt de-risked technologies uh, quicker and to have a, a a more rapid impact on their ability to produce these drugs. And I think the next one, Tim. So basically, the way that we engage with our industry members and our academic members is in a couple of different processes. We have an open call project process. 
where we generate ideas from our members and fund projects that are generally about a year in length and can be anywhere from a couple hundred thousand up to about a million. This is really important because it provides uh, it provides non diluted funding to our small to mid sized companies and also some funding to some academic labs. But what you're going to be hearing about later from Tim are our nimble led, or we often call nimble and industry led uh, programs. And these are these are programs that have been under discussion for quite a while now and have been rolling out. If you were on two weeks ago, you heard about our big data program. And again, you're going to hear about uh, the vector manufacturing program. And there's a series of these thanks to uh, the team here at Nimble that are going to roll out over the coming months. But these are uh, the Nimble led programs are strategic collaboration projects around a particular theme. And thanks to the fact that we're now in our sixth year, we can have a longer term vision uh, about where the industry is going and what would be beneficial. What are the real world challenges that need to be solved, but can't be solved in a 12 month, uh, you know, open call project. Uh, we're really pleased to have robust engagement from our nimble industry members to make these projects a success. Tim. Next. So these are the projects to date. Uh, we've engaged with large companies to help define and shape these programs. Uh, we call it the nimble community, but we've enabled the, the ecosystem to move uh, at, a, at a scale and a speed that can't be accommodated by a once a year open project call. And we uh, have been successful in obtaining deep engagement with our industry subject matter experts and thought leaders through the steering committees. Uh, the eventually the small companies and academics uh, will benefit by being invited uh, to participate in various projects. And that's the story of Nimble. So, Tim, good luck with your session, and thank you again for the invitation to present the background. Thank, thanks very much, Chris. Very much appreciate it. We wanted to give people a bit of a snapshot of the scale and scope of, of Nimble, and, you know, as we get into conceiving of the viral vector manufacturing analytics program, and you know, we're hoping to leverage the, the scale and scope of Nimble and the ecosystem as a whole to try to make advances. So in, in the next uh, little while, I'm just going to give a, a bit of an overview of, of where we are in the program. We're, we're hoping to reach a full launch point for the program next year. We've been uh, in the process of uh, engaging the community through a series of workshops and thinking about and digesting what that means and, and what it should mean. Uh, and uh, talk a little bit about what 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 we're headed towards uh, with regard to that uh, in terms of the program uh, structure and, and vision. Um, as we did hold a couple of, of uh, you know exciting workshops, uh, one, one at the end of last year and one in the first half of this year on on process and analytics, we had decided that we needed to focus initially. On, on AAV uh, because the scale and scope of viral vectors is so broad uh, and the community is so diverse that at least focusing in uh, was, was necessary for us. Uh, and uh, we had really exciting engagements on both, both the uh, process and, and the analytics side. Um, and I just wanted to you know, give thanks to the participants in those workshops that greatly inform what you're gonna see today. I'm not really, going to give a, an outcome of the workshops themselves rather than having digested and processed that information. How does it direct the way we would like to set up the program and what we expect to be working on? Uh, I do want to emphasize uh, that the, the, uh, the experts really drove the, these workshops and we benefited from, uh, in the process, Eric Barton and, and uh, uh, Stephen Kaminsky led the technical discussions across that workshop, which enabled us to have a real uh, uh, and animated uh, discussion among people that knew what they were talking about and that we tried to use to inform our program. Uh, and likewise, on the analytics side, uh, Thomas Powers and John Scheel uh, did likewise and, and uh, really helped us to, to develop a, a strong uh, engagement with the community on those. Uh, so thanks to, to them and to everyone that participated in those because it greatly informed uh, what, what, what you'll see uh, coming up. So just as an overview of, of uh, where, where we're headed uh, in terms of the vision and structure, we, we picture really uh, in, in the AAV space, 
uh, trying to use the community in a different way than perhaps the technology and the community engaged in the course of protein therapeutic development. I was heavily involved in the, the early therapeutic protein work uh, in my history at the Genetics Institute and Wyeth and Pfizer and you know, engaged with that community over many years. We developed therapeutic proteins and MABs and we, we actually worked on the technologies uh, in, uh, while sharing at conferences, largely uh, in our own silos uh, and sharing you know, what, what, what we could share over time in our progress and we leveraged and built upon those. But it actually took some 20, 25 years to develop that technology to really high performance uh, it, by doing it that way. And our vision for the viral vector is we're in a hurry here. Uh, and we don't think we have the time to, to actually do things in, in quite so progressive silo, wonder what they're doing uh, away. And the idea here we came to learn through the, the MABs is kind of ended up in the same place, honestly, with the technologies, not identical, but, but very similar over time. Uh, and we realized that a lot of the competition was really around the proprietary products that we were trying to make. Uh, and not so much around the technology. So in this go around with viral vector, uh, especially with a focus on, on uh, a lot of rare diseases in which uh, the viral vectors seem like they're gonna be heavily applicable, uh, we, want, we really wanted to try to do more sharing and try to advance the field more rapidly. Uh, considering how fast technology changes, we don't even know how long AAV as a, as a modality uh, will we'll, we'll have, uh, you know, legs. And, you know, we like to think that it will be a good while, but things change fast. So we, we really feel like we're in a, in a hurry here and need to try to share and leverage the community to advance the technologies as a whole uh, so that patients can benefit from the products. And as you'll see without reading through all of this, we're, we're planning to make broadly available a ro robust, replicable, and shared access platform for manufacturing, process product and product characterization, batch release and stability monitoring. Uh, and we're also hoping to advance the technologies in both process and analytics. And from a structural standpoint, we're thinking about doing this through two main work streams, one on process uh, and one on analytics. And I'll, I'll go through that in a, in a bit uh, for each of these. And an important thing to mention about the structure of, of these programs is that we, we intend to launch work streams to, to basically develop and guide the program in the process focused and analytically focused areas. What we are going to be showing in the next few slides is what we heard during the workshops, not all of it, but some of the digested version of that. Uh, but the notion would be to kick the work streams off with this as a start with that material as a starting point, but to really turn the specific plans and priorities over to the experts within the work streams and allow them to develop and refine those plans and to develop a program steering team that would provide advisory input. Uh, but the work streams would really be where the experts uh, are, are driving things uh, from the, the what do we need standpoint. And then from a project structure perspective, a program structure perspective, much of the work itself would be conducted through discrete projects uh, that basically uh, anyone uh, could apply to participate in uh, from within the Nimble community. And you can see, I'm not gonna read through the, the remainder of these uh, objectives over, over time, but we're hoping to, to share this, this, this information broadly uh, we use the convening power of Nimble and the fact that we don't have uh, skin in the game other than, than for the community as a whole, uh, no, no specific uh, proprietary interest uh, of our own and use our neutral position to try to bring people together and to leverage and advance the community uh, uh, together. So I'm gonna go into briefly uh, the objectives of the process uh, work stream as we envision it. Uh, and two main objectives, uh, the first being to develop a shared access AAV process platform with a focus on rare and ultra rare diseases. And um, we, from what the discussions we had uh, with the, the, the workshop team, we feel that this should be an HEK uh, focused expression system. 
uh, and focusing on limited number of key serotypes uh, would be important. Uh, developing robust and scalable protocols uh, uh, for suspension transfection with access to key starting materials, including cell line uh, and, and plasmid vectors. Also, uh, upstream process, chemically defined media, uh, serum-free suspension culture, uh, and uh, balancing cell densities for transfectability, productivity to contemporary standards. So we're not talking about here the absolute leading thing that requires a lot of development. We're trying to bring together what's known today, something that can be can brought together that we know that can deliver good performance, but it doesn't have to be on a knife edge of outstanding performance that, that might be you know next generation to the community, rather something that can deliver with a focus on demonstrating capabilities uh, uh, and expectations for the process, both on the upstream and downstream side. Uh, so I mentioned upstream, downstream, clearly a need for a toolkit there uh, and trying to do uh, uh, enrichment for, for full capsids, uh, demonstrating applicability across uh, serotypes and, and, and non-proprietary transgenes, trying to demonstrate you know, using a validation-like approach, trying to demonstrate the platform process uh, and what can be expected from it with the idea that over time, the learnings from that, from that could be leveraged to reduce the amount of program to program work that might be required uh, from investigators. And don't wanna forget uh, fill finish uh, storage and stability uh, an interest in incorporating that so uh, people will be able to leverage uh, and, and deliver end-to-end uh, -end, uh, products for, for rare diseases. Um, but then moving on, there's also a lot of interest and in, in need to, to advance the field. Uh, and so advancing process performance uh, for, for both the HEK platform uh, and uh, the baculovirus uh, SF9 system uh, were perceived to be important. So we, we'd like to help uh, you know, to advance the access and understanding of the SF9 based system, which is appears to have uh, large scale uh, scale up advantages. Uh, there are some questions about uh, whether product quality, you know, as apples to apples comparable with with the HEK based system and would like to you know, enable some of those types of studies so that the familiarity uh, and issues with the, the platforms are better understood and even try to help enable uh, the switch from one system to another during the course of development. There are advantages, perceived advantages, at least to speed and flexibility with the transient system. Uh, but if, if uh, a program wanted to convert, uh, being able to help with the comparability of switching systems uh, and, and from you know, one program to another or within a program uh, would be something that we'd be looking at. Uh, there's also a need to look into whether uh, improved expression systems could be developed. There's, there's already proprietary effort going on in that space. Uh, and there certainly seems to be room uh, for, for, for that within the community, uh, both improved upstream and improved downstream uh, performance. Um, and so some of this uh, effort, we've actually already, you know, gotten some work started uh, on a few things. I'll, I'll mention that in a bit. Uh, as, as you may know, uh, we have a program with, with uh, Karen Cross uh, that has initiated some platform work, which we hope, hope to be able to leverage uh, in the future uh, for, for broader access to the community. Uh, and we will be looking to start some other uh, projects. I have one on the analytical side I'll mention in a bit. I, I'm going to stop there for a moment just to see if there are any questions that have come in in the chat, uh, Angie, uh, before I move on to the analytics. Yeah, Tim, we have a question. Um, any plans to do head-to-head -head comparisons of HEK and SF9 systems regarding performance and product quality? Yeah, that's that's a great question. We, we think that would be valuable. Obviously, as I said, we, we turn this over to the work streams to, to decide on when and how to do that and with whom uh, and, and how that might be approached. Uh, but it does seem like something that would be valuable to do head-to-head -head type studies like that. Uh, and you know, being able to do something that, that is real and represents each of the systems in terms of performance means you got to you know, work with the right folks to do that. Uh, and then getting really good analytical results 
uh, which not everybody has access to, would be necessary in order to do a robust comparison uh, across the board there. And then pushing that out, you know, what we see uh, to the community. We don't, as I, as I said, we don't have have, have any bias here, uh, you know, or, or ax to grind. Uh, we just want to, you know, make it available. We'll take one more. Um, any, uh, um, are there other cell lines besides SF9 and HEK being explored? Well, there, there, there are out in the community uh, right now. And part of why I put it there that we, you know, would certainly not be uh, closed from, from taking an interest in improved systems. You can, there are, you know, efforts within the HEK family uh, to reduce the need, the dependence on transient transfection. And then there are other systems out there that also are pursuing uh, opportunities outside of, of, of that, that transient space, uh, taking uh, advantage of, of synthetic biology and gene editing approaches, uh, and overcoming some of the limitations that have been observed uh, with the existing systems, and that can be expected, frankly, with with the interface between a, a viral-based system and 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 uh, say mammalian cells that have have evolved to try to resist uh, being taken over by viruses. Thanks for those questions. Maybe we'll move on uh, to the analytics side. Now it's it's so clear from the discussions that uh, in to be successful. Uh, in, in AAV-based gene therapy, analytics is just you know, completely essential. Uh, and there's so much uh, uh, to, to learn uh, re with regard to how you're doing with your process and what you have for product through high quality analytics. Uh, at, the, at the other end of the spectrum, and I don't wanna say this from the standpoint of, of, of speaking about quality, there's also a need for reliable uh, access to batch, just fundamental batch release assays uh, and try to, to improve the reproducibility and availability of the fundamental assays that, that might be used. And I don't want to, you know, while there are two sides to this slide, uh, it, it, I wouldn't want to imply that these are actually a bright line between them. It, where we are with the field right now uh, that, that there's really a continuum of information that's needed in order to develop an AAV product. Uh, we need batch release and stability type assays that you can count on and compare from one batch to another or one stability point to another over time. And that has kind of a different uh, need uh, associated with it than informationally oriented uh, type uh, analytics that we might put in the process and product characterization bucket, but some of those may over time mature into the batch release and stability side of things. So I, I, I listed here, you know, that some platformable methods we'd like to try to develop based on what is known now about the key core assays uh, for vector genome and capsid and purity, uh, maybe, maybe uh, you know, cap, uh, VP ratios, uh, and the like, as well as you know, the, the, the well-known and of great interest percent full or perhaps uh, percent less than full, uh, depending how we might go about that. And also some interest in, in addition to taking advantage of what's out there, which we would try to harmonize, disseminate, apply, and build a data set around, uh, really try to, to enable some methods that are that are needed but perhaps not fully available today for 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 release and to work on development and determine the feasibility and applicability of some of these methods for platforming and here you know potency is so important uh, and is very challenging uh, and the big gap in, in you know what's available and, and readily accessible and it requires a huge and early investment. Uh, so looking into how we might make available uh, a cell-based uh, platformable potency assay that could be used for early stage stage potency, uh, hopefully you know with it with a, at least uh, focus on on transduction plus mRNA expression as a, as a as a minimum, uh, but something that that appears to be something that ought to be platformable to a certain degree, and we'd like to invest in that. This was like a strong consensus uh, from, the, from the workshop uh, to see what could be made available there that, that people could leverage. Uh, 
There's also a lot of interest. There's so much material that gets used in, 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 in to testing uh, that trying to find material sparing methods and also methods that might be allow multi attributes, multiple attributes to be done with a similar test, such as SAC malls or something uh, that, that could allow more quality attributes uh, to be uh, evaluated with potentially lower cost and effort and material use. And, and there's some of the compendial tests and others that use lots of material. So these are not really ready right now uh, for, for you know, full application, uh, but in the release and stability space, we'd be interested in, in trying to see what could be done there. So there's development work uh, and dissemination work. And then access to and, uh, better tools and, and broader access to processing product characterization uh, tools uh, would, would also be of great interest. And, uh, I want to mention here we we've already you know got a quick start uh, project that really done before we were able to you know get our head around this program fully in a collaboration with NIST and USP and Nimble uh, for methods uh, to to evaluate full and empty and partial capsids and I put etc there because that 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 program is advancing and data is being crunched now from a variety of methods across a number of organizations. Uh, from a first study that was done there, and we would be interested in you know, then looking at what needs to be done to extend beyond that initial study uh, to make the make methods uh, more available to the community and that information uh, we expect to come out you know sometime next year. Uh, in the analytical workshop, there was a huge interest in this this question of of full, empty, and partials. Like, what have you got in the, in the vector? Uh, and, you know, I even put the word definition there because I, I think we probably spent as much time talking about what do these terms even mean uh, that, uh, and about the methods that could evaluate them. Uh, but one strong consensus there was trying to get uh, the next generation sequencing approaches uh, are likely to really provide a great deal of additional information. Obviously, these aren't uh, over there on the left side and ready for relief yet. Uh, but trying to use and make available uh, approaches to NGS uh, what was thought to be valuable, uh, including algorithms uh, that, that would be useful. And there I, I mentioned that we are intending to you know, set up a collaboration, just getting it going with the Nimble Big Data program around this, this part of the program uh, to try to make that more accessible to the community. And then, uh, the, the whole suite of, of higher end characterization, the large uh, bio, biopharma companies uh, generally have big analytical groups with all of these tools uh, and you know, basically trying to get the power of what they know, what they have, and what we might be able to have uh, to make it available to the community through capabilities, equipment, uh, and, and know-how and the utilization of that network, we would like to be able to link the access to this, uh, to our process work, to our, our uh, platform work, uh, to make the access broader. And you know, many folks won't be able to afford all of the equipment, try to use that work and complement to that, which is, is trying to drive toward focused, simple, less expensive uh, access, uh, especially in, in the ultra rare disease space. And then tools uh, for process and product related impurities. Uh, obviously, this is a part of every program uh, when you develop a biopharmaceutical. As we're trying to simplify uh, this, we like to use the platform approach uh, on the process side and complement that with a platform approach on the analytic side, see what we can learn uh, that would help to simplify and be able to leverage data uh, from, from uh, one program to another uh, so that our understanding of expectations could become increasingly familiar uh, and might reduce the load of overall testing program to program uh, by leveraging you know, the, the, the platform data uh, across programs. And then there is a lot of, of need for uh, analytical tools that are rapid turnaround to support uh, process work. Uh, and so, you know, trying to see what could be done in this space for high throughput and rapid turnaround so that you can get your answer uh, on, on, on uh, uh, process performance and impact on 
on uh, process, product quality quickly uh, so that you can make decisions more, more, more quickly uh, is another area of, of interest. And without going on for too much longer, uh, another big area that came out in the workshop that we think would be important to develop and takes advantage in part of our, our convening power in Nimble uh, and in the AAV space would be to focus uh, some on the support of, of AAV reference resources. And here I don't mean by any means that we want to take over the universe. There are a lot of organizations that, that know a lot here and, and have efforts already ongoing. Uh, and we'd like to use our convening power to connect into these and to help to, to, to determine what can be done and needs to be done for reference material development uh, and try to get some of that going. And if we would see our role more on the early side of that uh, and in helping to generate some prototype materials and get early characterization and expectations for reference materials going with an aim to help to, to you know, move that along at, with an, and an eye toward the, the more mature standards development organizations being the right folks to actually uh, own and deliver out into the community uh, for the long term uh, these reference materials and for their various purposes. Uh, so this would be more on the earlier development side of things. And then likewise, uh, playing a role in, in both the documentary standards and expectations uh, for, for AAV and you know, perhaps using that information, the generation of some reference data from our process and analytical work uh, that can be made available to the community. And one thing that was emphasized here is the importance of, of data with integrity uh, that could be used in CMC filings uh, and emphasizing the generation of data along those lines. Uh, that then could be uh, generated into a, you know, something along the lines of a master file approach uh, someday that then would, would truly be leverageable uh, from, from one program to another would be, would be really exciting. Uh, so a, a number of activities in this space that we think fit with the analytics work stream sort of naturally and are in complement to that and reach over into and would have a relationship uh, to the, the process work as well. So I think I will stop there and see if we have any questions that have come in on the analytics side. We do have questions. We have a couple of questions that are really big questions, good, big questions, but a lot to try to answer in a webinar. So I'm going to choose some of the uh, more precise ones. Um, along with the analytics, has there been an effort to understand the effect of empty and full ratios on patients in the form of cellular toxicity of off-target effects? I, uh, I I believe there is a lot of work going on in that space. I don't think that with Nimble's biopharmaceutical manufacturing focus that it's probably the right space for us to be in. Uh, but this is clearly a key area, uh, you know. And I have seen you know a lot of discussion and interest across the community. I'm not the best person to say you know where that effort is right now. Okay. Is Nimble going to work with companies and or agencies to come up with regulations and standards around product and process characterization for AAVs? I definitely hope to. I don't think that we will do that alone. Uh, the there's a lot of engagement already. We have, have had the benefit of engagement with many companies and, and with FDA and a great deal of discussion around uh, that topic and really what's up on the slide right now would say we would want to increase the sort of structure around those engagements. Uh, and you know our role would be complementary to other roles uh, there in trying to make sure we understand what that landscape looks like, find the gaps, don't want to don't want to duplicate efforts here. And this is one of the challenges you find uh, is there are a lot of different efforts going on out there and we would like to try to uh, you know, bring those together as as much as possible. Identify the gaps. You know, say let's focus this 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 organization and that interaction uh, on driving that particular area and not try to duplicate. Okay, we'll take one more from this session and then I'll try to get the rest in in the Q and A. Um, would the analytics test bed be available to all nimble nimble members? And the second part is, would there be training on these instruments? 
Those are great, great questions. I, I, I can't say we have an exact model for how the analytics text bed would look, but Jen, and, and the second question, you know, about training is, is it's a really good one. I haven't, didn't manage to incorporate into these slides the, the workforce overlay opportunities of all of this, but they are many. Uh, and the, if you use the analytical test bed as an example, uh, the opportunity to have equipment in the UD uh, analytical labs uh, and people to come in and use those uh, to, to learn how uh, to and, and help us develop those methods would be you know, a great opportunity. So yes to that. The, the way we will approach the access is something we still have to sort out a bit, but I think you know, generally what we're hoping to do is, I don't think we see a service lab here you know, model but our programs need to benefit from the access to the analytics. So we expect to have a lot of really high powered analytical capability in, 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 in this lab. Uh, and we want to make it available to our programs. We likely have to do some scheduling and prioritization across programs uh, there, but we wanna keep that, that capability up and running. And I, I would say, I really hope that it will be complemented by access across to the community uh, and, and access to, to analytical resources across the community, uh, both people uh, and perhaps time on instruments uh, as we pose and develop questions uh, in, the, in the process space and in the analytical space. And we're certainly open to suggestions for how that could work, but we set up the labs at UDelaware so that people could come in uh, and they're, they're intended to be uh, capable of hosting. Okay, Angie, can I move on then? Yes. All right, so where are we going with the program from here? Uh, so here at the top is a little bit of a, uh, a an overall timeline. Uh, and we the webinar is today, we put that in the middle. Uh, again, thanks, a uh, lot of uh, interesting and important input. Uh, that we've we've taken from the community, both through the workshops and a lot of uh, other interactions. Greatly appreciate those. Uh, we extended extended that through the national meeting uh, conversations uh, back in July and got additional input uh, from that. We've been working on kind of our membership model, uh, you know, leading into this this as we start to pursue the sign up and recruitment. Uh, 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 of the program or early next year. Uh, and they, I have on the right, so we've, we've had this in, a lot of engagement uh, leading into this to sort of say, what, what do we think it's gonna look like? And uh, I, I hope that we have, are able to maintain an ongoing communication with the community for awareness of what's going on. Uh, we see that little flag up there for the national meeting next year and we, are you know ambitious about being able to say a lot more about where we are by that point. So really hoping to go from idea to uh, a launch of a program uh, in that space. And just by for what we're really hoping to to do is to you know bring in uh, a, a broad expert base to take advantage of uh, for this program. Uh, and so where we are today, we're going to, the tier one uh, uh, members are we're going to go to first and ensure that they're interested in helping to drive this program. Uh, they have uh, full rights by virtue of their tier one participation to participate in all the nimble led programs. Uh, so we're going there first and saying, you guys uh, are already basically in and we hope to, to have, have you. Uh, take a leadership role in this program. Uh, we will then be going to other members, uh, and these are listed in parallel because we, we want to sign up others uh, that will say yes, we want to participate in this program, uh, and and uh, you know are interested in in joining the fully the viral vector program. Uh, there are also you know as it relates to nimble, uh, and we we have some on 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 the call here. Uh, other organizations, especially those that are involved in viral vector for which Nimble didn't have a cohesive acti set of activities in the past, we really hope to draw in more members into it because we want the participation 
uh, in, in uh, this program to really reflect the expert base and leverage the expert base of the community as a whole. So we have a significant recruitment drive uh, plan to try to, to uh, you know, bring, bring that together. And as I mentioned, I don't wanna imply that this is an, intended to be an overly centralized effort. Uh, we really wanna take advantage of capabilities across the network. Uh, so we need folks to, to join uh, and, and sign up and, and help to do this. And we intend then, as we see that going along, populate a steering team that will help to guide the overall program and populate process and product works, uh, pro process and analytical work streams uh, with experts uh, from that recruitment effort that will re really turn this from, in, in, from uh, concept into you know, planning reality. And those work streams are where the proposals for products will then be sought, uh, and we expect that RFPs will be going out for members to then join, participate, and help to drive the actual work forward. Uh, and so it's going to take a little bit of time to get that going. I do want to, you know, mention that we'll probably do some quick start projects before we have this whole formed. Uh, we, as I mentioned, the the uh, NIST USP effort, uh, the Karen Cross effort. Uh, we are hoping to get some of that next generation sequencing work uh, going uh, in advance uh, with the big data team. Uh, and but further, you know, expect to uh, leverage the expertise of the steering and work stream teams uh, to to drive the program uh, going forward. So uh, with that, I guess I'll stop again and open up for Q and A. Angie, now you're going to have to do dealer's choice and and pick the best things that are available from all. Okay, so there's been quite a few questions around our collaborations with other consortiums. Um, the theme of the question seems to be that there is lots of work planned by many stakeholders and companies and how we plan on avoiding duplication among the consortiums and what are our um, arrangements with things like NIST and USP and standards coordinating body. Um, a lot of questions around that. I'll give you a few minutes to uh, pull all that together. <laughs> well, there's a lot to unpack there. So I, I, I'll say, I, I, I don't know that I can give a comprehensive answer to that question. I, I would say, you know, thank you. Thank you for the question. It's a very important uh, consideration and one that we really hope to populate our teams uh, in a manner that we will have access to and awareness of uh, these these various efforts and I uh, definitely want to bring them together. We don't want to compete. I uh, don't see ourselves as, as in competition and, and our and our roles, uh, you know, have you know distinct uh, positions within the community. I think, you know, I mentioned the convening aspect of it. Uh, and I, I really believe in that as, as a benefit. Uh, we, we in, in terms of, of Nimble's national mandate uh, based on the manufacturing uh, USA structure uh, has a unique role, uh, but it doesn't mean taking over other roles is not the way we're seeing that and, and uh, really would like to and see ourselves as being able to partner with the various organizations uh, and where, where funding can help. Uh, we'd like to try to make that available where you know simply networking can help and take advantage of and pointing to and then pushing messages out about where what things are going to happen uh we'd like to be able to do that also okay we'll take a couple of more specific uh content technical questions um are there other cell lines between besides sf9 and hek that we are exploring i think we did that one already angie uh, did we uh, so oh, i didn't we're, cross we're, that one off but... Um, okay, uh, a scale up size anticipated for HEK. Ah, great, great question. Uh, I, I, in our workshop, we discussed, I think, think I'm aware of, of transient work now up to, you know, many thousands of leaders in some of the, the leading companies. Uh, uh, so, you know, quite remarkable ambitions. Um, Generally speaking, the ultra rare disease community uh, felt like being able to scale to 200 liters uh, would be would be very valuable. I think initially we'll hope to 
uh, you know, at least work to develop our platform up to 50 liter scale and then see what we can access uh, across our network uh, uh, for, for larger scale uh, runs. And then perhaps if we have a platform in the future, we'll also be able to stack the data from large scale runs that are being used for actual clinical production uh, onto uh, the, the platform data, uh, make those available, and we'll really continue to grow our, our overall data set. So I'd, I'd say, you know, Angie, in the technical, you know, we're likely to have 50 liter scale uh, ambitions within the, within the nimble test bed. Uh, I don't know if we'll go larger than that internally, but I do believe that there will be capacity out in the community and interest and willingness to use that capacity for some of these studies that would allow us to, uh, to go to larger scales. And there's a question that we saw a lot in our process, which is the comparison of HEK and SF9 systems. Yeah, uh, so yeah, the, 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 uh, there's just a need for, for more, more overt work there and head to head work. Uh, and so I think we did have a lot of interesting discussion during the workshop uh, about those comparisons. Uh, the, the folks that practice the most, the SF9 system feel very confident uh, in that system to be able to deliver good vector, although there are others out in the community that have had less success with that. And, you know, regardless of that, whether that's, you know, familiarity or, comp familiarity or confidence with that platform, it sort of begets a need uh, for the community uh, because if you if it if it's that specialized that that uh, it needs additional uh, training and capability push out, uh, then that alone you know causes uh, you know uh, a, a drive for additional uh, work and and access to that system and an understanding of what you can expect from it and when it would be best fit for you would be would be definitely of value. There's a similar question for the analytical part about um, are we planning PD measurements across organizations? P D P D measurements? Yeah. P, uh, as in process development. I'll have to get further clarification. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll that, say yeah. yes if it's that. Uh, <laughs> so you know what, what, I, what I do think is that we have some experimentation to do on on uh, process. Uh, to try to arrive at a shareable platform. And that experience itself is going to require, you know, good analytical data sets uh, uh, across those experiments and, and work in order to know that, that uh, we, what we have. Uh, this is sort of the same thing inside any individual company. You rely heavily on the analytics as the eyes and ears of process development. Uh, and you know how we would go about that is likely to be some combination of of some central analytics that may be applied across uh, different uh, process development experiments and work, uh, but also the benefit of reference materials you know can't be be understated when it allows you know crossover from one analytics uh, set to another. Uh, so this is a big driver uh, for for that whole uh, area of reference materials. And I have been corrected. It is pharmacodynamics. This is a good lesson in why um, acronyms are not the same for everyone. <laughs> uh, so, so you know, not li likely. I uh, will we'll be shying away from getting into the the uh, analytical uh, and and in terms of animal experimentation and animal animal outputs uh, that are more in the preclinical type space. Uh, and other other organizations are focused in that in that space. We're going to stick more to the biopharmaceutical manufacturing uh, technologies and approaches. Okay, I think that's actually the last question that we can take. Tim, if you can go to the next slide. Okay, one more. <laughs> so, as a reminder, if you're a Nimble member, you can follow projects from the portal. It's a simple process as seen here. Um, if you select multiple projects uh, to follow, you will only receive one email uh, update at a time. Uh, Tim, can you go to the next slide? And as a reminder, there will be a survey sent out. Um, you'll get a link shortly after the webinar. After you complete the survey, you'll have immediate access to the slides and the webinar recording. 
what I didn't mention earlier was that in January, all the recordings will be available. Um, I'm going to guess from the website. Uh, we have two upcoming uh, Nimble Ed program webinars on December 7th, an intro into NMAB, and on the 17th, um, a biomanufacturing readiness level, the same times as we have now. And um, in closing, uh, thank you for attending. And please feel free to reach out to Tim or myself if you have any questions regarding the vector program. Um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.